You've got no chance. You're just a dreamer staring into space. What makes you think you can break through when so many others couldn't? That's what rang in my ears when I was a kid. 11 years old. I'd got a dream burning inside me. I felt different, but nobody had broken out of where I came from. Except Robin Hood, and he lived in a tree just down the road from me. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was cursed with ambition. It's a very funny conjunction of words, but I was cursed with ambition. I heard somebody say the other day about someone else. He was burnt to the bone with the fury of his own ambition. And that was me. It was awful. Um, I just couldn't figure a way through. Um, but I just knew something inside me told me I would. Um, I was born 20 miles down the road in a place called Worksop. Uh, some say on the wrong side of the tracks in Manton. Um, we lived in my Nana's house, Annie Bohm. She was a widow. Uh, I lived there with my mum and dad, my auntie Kath and Uncle Brian, and their, their baby daughter Karen. So it was a very cosy, as you can imagine. It was uh, one fire, tin bath by the fireplace. Um, <clears throat> I can remember the toast on the toasting fork, Mother's Pride on the end. And uh, that's bread, if you won't remember. But <laughs> Mother's Pride and the smell of that toast. Um, but it was happy days. The house was full of love. And uh, I only say it because it's, it's not where you come from. It really isn't. It's not an excuse. Um, I wanted to try and tell what I'm about to impart to you without it being about me. I think this world is full of too much me. Everybody is me, me, me. And I always remember Muhammad Ali when, uh, when he was the most famous person on the planet. And uh, he was doing the Oxford Union. And, and all the students said, tell us a poem, champ, tell us a poem. And he said the greatest poem I've ever heard. Me, we. And really, that's it. And uh, my speech is unscripted. It will be the first time I've heard it today. Um, I know where I'm going, but I hope we find some interesting twists and turns. Uh, I wanted to speak from my heart. I wanted to uh, fill this space between us. I know magic can happen in that space. We've heard a lot of talk about encouragement, belief, faith, inspiration. Can't see them, can you? You can see them manifest in people. But when it, like, like so many great speakers have said today, you know, when it hits home, it's like, pff, like a spark inside you. I look around this room, you know, and there's young people, middle-aged, old, young people full of hope, full of worries about the planet, wondering how they're going to make their way. Middle-aged people, did we make the right decision? Now am I going to pay my mortgage? What about the electric bill? Whatever. And then older people think, well, I've done my time, you know, it's over for me. I'm invisible now. It's, well, I promise each and every one of you, you're not. Uh, Self-worth, belief. Dreams, you know, people say dream big. Dreaming big it doesn't mean you have to dream about, you know, being a movie star or whatever. It means about personal development, being happy yourself, being content. Um, I wanted to say that this is not about me. Anything I've succeeded in, my records, my films, my scripts, they were gifts. I believe they were given to me by God, by a greater power, by the universe. That's a talk for another day. But um, I know they were given to me. Uh, I'm a craftsman. I practice still hard every day. But when I was given these things, I just peeled away the layers and kept looking and working till it revealed the diamond that I knew occasionally I'd been given. Sometimes they were pebbles. Sometimes they were diamonds. Um, I think if you take too much credit for what you do, you're lost. 
We see so many people, they do great things and it's how great they are. And then they get on a bit and they can't do it anymore, can they? And I think they, they believed it was them when it wasn't. It was gifted. You've heard the word, he's gifted, this child's gifted. Choose to make your own mind up. But I think as soon as you believe it's you, you're lost. The ego takes over and it becomes, it becomes me. Um, I had a wonderful life growing up and I think it grounded me really well. And my mum, Norma Parr, uh, when we moved from my nana's house to the shiny new council estate, we didn't have much money, but she could make a jam sandwich, an orange cordial and a penguin biscuit, an event, make it special. We'd sit on that front doorstep at 170 Kilton Hill. And it was magic. And she used to say, you know, I wish it could be nice for everybody. Sounds a corny thing, but what, I wish it could be nice for everybody. And when she died, um, I thought about writing a book and calling it Nice No More. But it isn't true. Uh, the greatest rewards I've found in my life have been about helping other people, giving ex you know, encouragement. People will come to me sometimes and say, you don't know what that song did for me, what those lyrics did. They got me through college. They got me through illness. Or even if it's just a smile or a kind word. I mean, I mean, you must feel today with all these wonderful people giving of their time and their belief and their passion. And particularly in this last section with the young people, doesn't it make you feel good to think, well, this young, we're, not pretty, we're in pretty good shape to think young people are like that forward thinking, that honest and that honorable. And, and um, they came through a lot. And they're, you know, they're making their way. It humbles me. Um, in rehearsals, I would always break up. I'm glad I'm not crying today, um, but everybody will tell you on the show, I, I, I usually cry, a bit of a crybaby. I'm a hopeful romantic. I am a dreamer. Um, but I do want to say that uh, dreams are real. It's just how badly you want them to happen. I was desperate. I used to say, when I make it, never if. It sounds arrogant, you know. Heard all those bad things I told you at the beginning, and I heard that till I was 15. All those teachers, all my schoolmates said it to me, and then we played the school dance, and we, and we slayed them. And all my teachers and all my mates said, forget everything we said, that's what you should be doing. So it encouraged me to go on. Another 15 years went by, still trying, still trying to break through. Couldn't do it. The truck finally blew up and so did the band. And my wife said, I'll pay the bills. You just write the songs. This was 1980. So she went to work and I just sat at home writing songs, sending them out, believing. One day the phone rang and it was Meatloaf. Um, hey, John, you know, I heard your songs. I want to I wanna, I wanna meet you. And within a month I was in, living with him and his family in Connecticut, working on his album. The dream began. The Who had just broken up. Their manager was looking for someone uh, to fill the void in his life. He took me on. I got a record deal. My first record went number one. And the phone rang again. And it was the world's most successful record producer. A guy whose records I'd been playing when I lived in Bowlby and would cry on the carpet thinking I'm never going to be able to make music like this. And fast forward three years later, he's ringing me and he said, I'm making a movie. Again, I say this not to brag. I say it because it was meant to be. And when I reveal this story, I think you'll see about what I'd gone through all those 30 years of struggle. So David Foster said, come to L.A. I'm making a movie called San Elmo's Fire. So I went to L.A. and um, it was my dream. And David said, look, I'm tired, John. I can't write anymore. Will you sing this song? And it was an okay song. But I just said, David, just let's have half an hour together and try and write something. I believe we can and he went, I'm, I'm exhausted, John. I, I can't do it. I said, just, just give me half an hour. So we went in the control room, and within 10 minutes, we wrote a great song. And I went, David, this is wonderful. He said, 
we can do better. Changed. We wrote another song, 10 minutes. It was even better. He said, we can do better. The third song, this is all within an hour, was St. Elmo's Fire. But I couldn't come up with the words. The film is about privileged kids living in college and I just got, you know, I was a kid, grew up on a council estate, you know, failed my 11 plus and didn't have a lot of empathy then. And I just couldn't come up with an idea. And he said, look, this has nothing to do with the movie. He said, but last week, a young boy from Vancouver, David's hometown, came into the studio and he gave me this video cassette. Video cassettes are things that people used to put in machines to see. <laughs> and... Um, so it was like a calendar, like a local news show. Put it on, and on screen comes this beautiful looking young man. You only see him from here. He looked like a young Kennedy. And he said, uh, a year ago, I went fishing with my friend. We had a great day, we caught some fish and we thumbed a lift home. And my friend jumped in the front of this pickup truck and Rick jumped into the back. And a mile down the road, the truck crashed and the toolbox in the back of the truck smashed into Rick's spine and broke it. And his buddy walked wi away without a scratch, and Rick was paralyzed. And this beautiful young man's looking into the camera, and he said, you break your arm, you break your leg, you're in a plaster cast for maybe six, eight weeks, but you break that one bone in your back, and you're in this chair for the rest of your life. And he said, my dream is that this chair's going to be in a museum one day. I want to raise money and awareness for spinal research. And I'm going to get in this chair, and I'm going to wheel it around the world, 22,000 miles. And the hairs are coming up on the back of my neck. I can feel it coming. It's a different story, but it feels like the story of me, the story of the barriers. And um, bear in mind, this is 85 85, you didn't quite know where to look when you saw, many, saw someone in a, in a wheelchair. It wasn't like the Olympics when everybody was cool in 212 in the gear and wheeling. Everybody looked cool. But, you know, 85, there was no internet. So a guy in a wheelchair wanting to wheel around the world wasn't really front page news. I went back to the hotel that night and um, got this piece of uh, hotel note paper. And I thought, I'm going to write his story. It was called the Man in Motion tour that he was on. And uh, I thought, I'll write it about him going up mountains and crossing deserts. And St. Elmo's fire, which is a freak of nature, it's when phosphorus is burning in the sky. He's looking towards it, wheeling towards his dream. And I thought, but the film company might find me out. So I thought, well, when I'm talking about the pair of wheels, they'll think it's Demi Moore's Jeep in the movie. And when he eventually succeeds, for once in his life, a man has his time, they'll think that's when Emilio Estevez gets the girl. So I wrote it. I went to the studio the next day. David's in, just David and I. David's in control room. I'm singing away. He goes, what are you singing about? I'd go, I'm singing about Rick Hansen, the video. So he went, this is like a multi-million dollar movie. He said, it's my first score, even though I've sold all these records. I'm not going to blow it on singing about, he's a great guy, but I'm not going to let you do this. I said, well, it's worse than that. I'm going to call it Man in Motion. And he went, you're dreaming. You know, it's that. It, um, so I recorded it, and he went, let's go with it. Let's go with it. I knew the deadline was tight. This was Sunday, and it was going to be dubbed into the picture on Monday. And that's what happened. The motorbike picked the tape up, took it, they dubbed it in the picture. And by the time Sony Pictures knew what was happening, it was Salam was fire man in motion. The rest is history. Two years, two months, and two days after Rick Hansen set out from Vancouver on a rainy shopping mall with three men and a dog waving him off, he wheeled back into Vancouver. Millions of people lying in the street, brass bands playing the sun almost fire, his anthem. He'd wheeled across the Great Wall of China, a million Chinese people singing Sen almost fire, his theme song. I don't know if they sang it in Chinese. I don't know. <laughs> and we'd raised 18 million Canadian dollars 
to that point. So you've got this young kid from Worksop that everybody said he couldn't do it. And you've got this kid from Vancouver that broke his back and everybody had written him off. And somehow, with the magic of David Foster, the three of us, we made this thing. Um, 35 years ago now, we've built i with the money. i is the world's leading foundation for spinal research. People with the same injury that put Rick in that chair for the rest of his life, if they're lucky, can walk again. That's how amazing it is. The fund now stands at a quarter of a billion dollars, and the dream continues. My point is, each and every one of you, whatever your dream is, a dream is such a little precious thing when it begins. It's like a little candle just flickering. And if someone honors you enough to share their dream with you, just think how, it, how precious it is. Think how somebody could look away on their telephone and go, oh yeah, all those stories we heard today. What I would say to you if you've got a dream, don't let anybody blow your candle out.